Okay. Uh, I've been just trying to put together some information about uh, greenhouse gases and transportation and trying to think about how we could meet the climate accord challenge, of, uh, the Paris climate accord of an 80% reduction by 2050. And uh, so that's, that's what I have here for you. Let's see. So uh, this is uh, just kind of top down. This, these are the latest statistics on greenhouse gas emissions by the U.S. Uh, and you can see that transportation overall has creeped up over the other sectors. And I can, uh, Greg, you can have this presentation if you want to post it someplace. This is all public information. Uh, within transportation, this is how it breaks down. Mostly, it's about cars and trucks. Um, this might take a little explanation, but um, this is uh, total carbon emissions out of the U.S. And over here is fuels, like petroleum down here at the bottom. And you can see the different sectors, transportation, uh, industrial, commercial, residential. And then the... the the important point that I think pops out here is that transportation is largely uh, energized by petroleum. And then the, uh, the others, uh, they may use petroleum as a feedstock or whatever. And you can see electricity generation up there. Right now in the U.S., or at least in 2014, the coal was the big source, but so is natural gas. But you can, you can see how that flows. Okay, so if you want to look uh, within an urban area, I found this structure or model uh, useful as a way to organizing thoughts. Uh, you have a, a demand for travel that's based on land uses, and out of that comes vehicle miles of travel by you know vehicles. One vehicle going one mile is one vehicle mile. Uh, that's also determined by community land characteristics like the vent, uh, density, diversity of land uses, and so forth. And then the transportation system itself, the, the availability and quality will determine this. If, for example, you have more transit service out there, you'll have more transit riders. If you have more roads, you'll have more road users. Okay. Uh, and so you've got all this travel going on by these vehicles, and that results in fuel consumption depending on the characteristics of the fleet, uh, their fuel economy, and out of this you get greenhouse gas emissions. The carbon content of fuel enters into all this as well. So if you have, say you have hydrogen powered vehicles, there is no carbon in hydrogen obviously, so you wouldn't have greenhouse gas emissions coming out of there. So it's a good way to organize thoughts and figure out where the levers are to try to change things, I think. Anyway. Uh, as I mentioned, the characteristics of the urban area, particularly population density, influences uh, not only energy consumption and transportation, and this is kind of a famous chart that's been put out, and I had a student add the San Antonio dot on this chart showing this is population density increasing out here. Here's Hong Kong out here. And the amount of uh, energy being used uh, per capita on an annual basis up on the, the amount of on the y-axis there. And you can see the higher the density, the lower the uh, energy use per capita. And Houston kind of tops the world as far as this chart is concerned. But it turns out population density not only impacts the transportation energy consumption, but also residential energy consumption and water consumption as well. <coughs> Uh, you've, uh, just trying to illustrate here that different modes of transportation obviously are more efficient than others. This is actually greenhouse gas emissions per passenger kilometer. And you can see, for example, actually the worst on here is an urban diesel bus during the off peak. If there's hardly anybody on it, it's not fuel efficient, right? Uh, on the other hand, during the peak, an urban diesel bus is the champion as far as fuel efficiency. So uh, 
depending on how you deploy the buses and use them, uh, it makes a big difference. Uh, interestingly, here's, here's, a, here's the uh, gasoline powered pickup out here. And here, here's an uh, aircraft. Uh, it actually takes more energy to carry a person a mile on a pickup truck than it does in an airplane. And uh, for those that are interested, and I know some are, in looking beyond just the fuel consumption itself, uh, this, uh, this adds in uh, vehicle manufacturing, infrastructure, and so on, the different colors represent uh, different sources of the, green power, uh, of the greenhouse gas emissions. So I found this kind of interesting. You know, the state of California has a law where they're going to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. I don't remember the exact details of uh, what their goal is. Uh, but uh, this, this one paper looked at, OK, how could we get down to this 80% below 1990 level, which I think is the Paris Accord one, isn't it? And uh, the light blue and this dark blue, the light blue is all kinds of energy efficiency in buildings and in transportation. The dark blue is electricity decarbonization, just like we've been talking about here with wind and solar and all that, getting carbon out of the production of electricity. So if you did those two, uh, in California anyway, it would bring them back down in, in, 20, in the year 2050, this analysis says that that would uh, get you back to where you were in, in 1990. Follow? So all this other, to get down to the 20% or the 90% below the 2050 baseline, uh, is uh, involved with these other things. Now they got to think about uh, smart growth. This is the land development aspects of things, more density and so on. The PV roofs, putting uh, PV on all the roofs, as many as you could. Biofuels, now this is something that doesn't make sense for a city to try to do, but this is like uh, cellulosic uh, alcohol fuel, for example. Uh, non-energy, non-CO2 things, and electrification. They're, here they're talking about primarily transportation electrification. Let me get, uh, there's a table that goes along with this that explains it a little bit better. So here's a, bu a building and energy efficiency up here at the top, the light blue. Uh, then this electricity decarbonization, I go into uh, carbon-free sources of uh, electricity. Here's smart growth to reduce vehicle miles of travel uh, by all sorts of transportation. Here's uh, the PV rooftop. Here's 2% natural gas use in buildings replaced by biomethane, 10 to 20% petroleum-based fuels for vehicles. Uh, and then non-energy, non-fuel, non-CO2, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this might be something like, yeah, cement and agriculture and then electrification. So this is, this is more than transportation, obviously. But it, I did like it because it showed how the land use and the transportation are, are considered. Now, what about here in San Antonio? How am I doing time-wise, Greg? Am I all right? You're good. Um, you got about 11 minutes. OK. In the, in, uh, the MPO has the, 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 the current long-range plan is mobility. They call it Mobility 2040. And this is a table out of their report, which you can get online. And they ended up looking at three scenarios for the future. And they, they ended up picking this one, scenario two, the long range trend. Uh, this was also on the table, something they call activity centers. But I want you to notice something that, uh, like the vehicle miles of travel, and that's a key indicator of how much greenhouse gases you're going to put out, right? In this scenario, the, green, the vehicle miles of travel are about 9% less than they are in the one that they adopted. And that's because of the land development characteristics. And if you read the report, it says they didn't pick this one. It also has other benefits. It's cheaper, cars would go faster, there's less time travel, et cetera, less miles travel, et cetera. The reason they didn't pick this is because they said, well, we don't have any control over land development. So it, was, it 
it wouldn't make any sense to pick that. Now, I have since talked to, I've been noodling about this, um, how can we deal with this? Because transportation and land use go together. You can't really separate them. Uh, and I, I uh, bumped into somebody, fortunately, who's been looking at this too, and I said, well, you know what other MPOs do is they use some of their planning money and they give it to cities so that they can do these kinds of planning. Thank you, Darby, I'm glad you're, <laughs> I'm glad you're interested in this. <laughs> Like in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, they have a sustainable planning fund that uh, if a city wants to study how they can do a more compact development pattern and come up with a plan, the MPO will help them pay for that. They'll use some of this federal money that's used for planning that they get and pass it on to the city to do that. So uh, that's pretty, uh, sounds relatively easy. Uh, it's just that nobody's proposed that yet here. Uh, but apparently it's going on in other places, other cities. Uh, as you know, uh, we've got now an adopted SA Tomorrow Comprehensive Plan that calls out for these regional centers. And to me, this is, oh, wow, here's, this is the same idea as before, where we have centers of development, and maybe this is the framework we need to go ahead and start planning for more intense development in these areas that are already intensely developed. That's why they picked them. Uh, the markets have decided that this is where they, uh, the city wants to grow, and so let's reinforce that rather than try to uh, go into neighborhoods and build high-rise apartments and stuff for neighbors. So, uh, so uh, it's one of my favorite cartoons. It's uh, time we started taking greenhouse effect seriously, we're facing global catastrophe, we gotta simply stop producing so much carbon dioxide, coming from fossil fuels, what can we do? The biggest problem is automobiles, and somehow the discussion always stops at this point. We, we tend to get, we just can't get past the point that we're starting to talk about automobiles. So that's my brief <laughs> look at, at uh, trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, starting to get some ideas together. Oh. <laughs> uh, thank you for that, but I, I uh, just wanted to share some, this is all public information, I'm not representing anybody, I'm just saying there's some ideas to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Zager had a really good time, obviously, we just had some transportation news, uh, there's stuff going on with the mayor and the commissioner, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on current discussion and policy in relation to greenhouse? Well, I'm glad they're talking about transportation, uh, public transportation. Uh, we really, uh, we are funding our transportation system at a fourth of what it needs to be funded. If you look at cities that are having success in reducing vehicle miles of travel and so on, they are funding four times the level. In fact, you don't have to Dallas is basically funding transport, and Houston and Austin are basically funding transportation four times the, the way we are. We're at basically a half cent sales tax, and they're at a full cent, so that's like twice, but we're a low income city. So if you adjust for the retail sales per capita, they're actually closer to three or four times what we are on funding. And all these studies, so you need to need to have more public transportation. That's, there's, uh, how else are people going to get around, you know? Uh, so uh, the, the key thing about, uh, I'm a bit of an advocate for rail transit, and one of the reasons is that economic development happens around rail stations. Rail stations don't move. <laughs> and so an investor is willing to invest in property around a rail station where bus stops can disappear overnight, right? Uh, so having something, uh, pardon the term, concrete in the ground to attract investment is, an, is important because of the land use aspect of things. we got plenty of time for, for conversation questions, yeah. Um, thank you so much. Do you have um, information or thoughts on the SA Connect? Um, I think it's new. Is, is Wait, that? Let me, let me, let me keep talking. Okay. I, 
think we I think very much we need an organization in San Antonio to keep informing people about transportation issues. Uh, I've been here over 20 years now. I came down here to be the planning director of VIA. Uh, and what I've seen in transportation, as well as other things, is somebody puts a proposal on the table and people polarize. Uh, and there's not really a good, healthy, open discussion about issues. If we could talk about transportation issues without a particular <laughs> proposal on the table so that people understand some of the dynamics, I think that would be very healthy. And, I, and as I understand it, this SA Connect may well do that. Other cities have done that. Uh, uh, Denver, Nashville, Tennessee, uh, others, uh, Portland, Oregon, have had a Citizens Academy where you actually go to some, a citizen that's interested, go to some classes and and uh, they graduate, and those graduates end up being running for city council and other positions and, and of influence, and they have a background in the topic. Sure. Um, but do you think it's it's um, do you think SA Connect is a possible place to build that relationship between the land use and transportation? Well, like I, you I, said earlier, uh, I don't see them building anything. I think they would be in the public education role. Okay. Seems like the mayor and, and the county judge want to do bus rapid transit type thing, uh, is what I was reading, and uh, with they don't have to do tracks, it's cheaper, it's more doable in their their view. They don't have a, they don't have to have a vote. You know, we had a city charter mm -hmm. amendment to where we have to vote if uh, we put rail in anything, any public oh, property. Oh, okay, yeah. Now but there are technologies uh, more and more. There's like rubber, t like like bus rapid transit. Uh, uh, it takes me to the point. Well, uh, can you get the land development response out of bus rapid transit like you do out of rail transit? And that's kind of the question then to me. Um, I haven't. I'm not an expert on the Primo system. I don't know that I've seen anything, particularly anybody develop anything around a Primo station. Well, if they have dedicated lanes where, you know, you don't have the red lights and all that. Uh, you know, Pittsburgh has had a busway forever. Uh, again, it'd be hard pressed to, uh, again, I'm not an expert, but I've, I've seen it. I didn't notice any particular development that you could say, well, that's because of the busway. Uh, Ottawa, Canada has a tremendous, it's almost like a mini freeway system for buses. It's mind boggling to see what they've done. Uh, <laughs> what they ended up with is a ton of buses downtown to where they realized, well, this isn't working because everybody was complaining about all the buses downtown. And so now they're building a light rail system and I think they're gonna put a tunnel underneath downtown, uh, like Seattle has done, for example. Can I ask, um, Bill, when you talk about polarization over these issues and, and, and moving away from rail as a way to avoid a uh, public vote or, or some of these issues, uh, that really has broken down, you say, around suburban and inner city interests. Uh, I know when the kind of the Tea Party and the Firefighters Union were fighting it, they were saying, why should we on the outskirts of San Antonio be subsidizing poor folks in town who take the buses to work or things like that? Did you hear that argument and how do you respond? I know like one of the things that, that I think is if we had a a major transportation initiative that included the outer ring of San Antonio so that we are serving, you know, suburban, exurban residents, then everybody has a stake and it may be easier to build consensus. Um, are we missing an opportunity? Well, uh, yeah, we need to have this discussion and talk about these things. Part, part of the transit system we have now is because, as I said, we've been starving it to death for decades now. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that park and ride facility going up on 281 at the TPC Parkway. It's it's big. It's uh, and it's suburban uh, for sure. And uh, so we'll see how all that works out. Uh, 
But I think if think about it, if you, if if you can only run a fourth of the service that you need to run, I think you'd end up being in the denser parts of the city, just as a practical matter, and uh, not have as much park and ride and and suburban c circulators and so on. Of course, nowadays there's a lot of discussion about. Um, ride-hailing services like Uber and Lyft, as well as electrifying those kinds of things. And, and the other thing, interesting thing that's related to this to me is uh, that's going on is with Amazon in particular, we have way too much retail space. As you know, you see retail stores going empty. Uh, and it's, it's really getting noticeable to where people are wondering whether they should build a parking garage or a parking lot and how big it should be. Uh, people are talking about building parking garages get, that can be turned into something else in the event that that parking never shows up because people are, you know, an, if, it, if it is an automated car, it drops me off at work and then it goes someplace and I don't even know where it goes, <laughs> right? But, but it doesn't need to be no. parked downtown waiting for me. That's, a, that's the inherent inefficiency with the current auto system, is if you own a car, you probably use it 5% of the day. The rest of the time, it's parked. That's pretty inefficient. Uh, and so these automated cars, in theory, would be moving around a lot more, which incidentally creates a lot of traffic and energy consumption. It's not necessarily going to reduce congestion. You'd be sitting behind robot cars at the traffic signals instead of cars with people in them. Uh, these are interesting times. Uh, if, if this retail space goes down, if there's way too much parking, that'll tend to drive down property rates. Uh, and uh, it, 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 may, it may turn into a kind of a redevelopment scenario where what do we do with this space? We can't put stores in it. There's not enough demand for that. And what do we do with all these empty parking spaces? I noticed that, Frankie, had you raised your hand to make a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, like, I mean, you said that when these proposals are brought to the table and then they kind of get diffused all the time, you know, it just this is something you guys talk about. I mean, what's the main reason you think why those don't go anywhere? I mean, I, I, it seems to me like, you know, many times these proposals and policies come into play, but then they get changed or they get ignored. And, Really, what it comes down to is the bottom line. If it doesn't affect the bottom line as far as financials for the corporation or for the, for the company, it's one of the main reasons why those kind of policies or proposals don't go anywhere. So, what would what would you say is the main reason why none of those proposals go anywhere? Uh, none of those proposals, like a light rails proposal, for example. Uh, I think it's more ideology than bottom line. Myself. When if a, if a person, if a household can save money uh, in transportation, that means they have money to spend on something else. And uh, uh, I used to work for the city's office of sustainability. I had an economic, I had a contractor develop an economic model. What happens if you put the EV on households and you reduce vehicle miles of travel and so on? And in the case of the vehicle miles of travel, it's a, pu it's a plus. The, the, uh, the household then has more money to spend uh, by spending more money for a taxable item and instead of gasoline tax, which there's no sales tax on gasoline tax, right? The city gets more money. Uh, the retailers get more money. Uh, there's more money to spend on getting a bigger apartment or a house. Or, I, mean, I mean, it's a positive thing. If you're trying to sell gasoline, it's not a positive thing. I think you'd be selling less gas. But uh, that's the way it goes. But I, I think, I, what, from what I've seen, it's more about ide ideology than it is about uh, bottom line. I mean, what uh, generally businesses benefit by having a good transportation system. And you mentioned going to New York. How about uh, rail, uh, good rail system? But the citizens of San Antonio voted to build MBC instead. Yeah, it's a lot of our people, too, voting to keep the Spurs <laughs> in San Antonio. I know we've got just got a couple minutes, but did you want to, you had a question earlier that... Oh, if someone else had a question, a comment up here. Yeah, let's make sure. 
All I wanted to all, all I wanted to point out was an eighty percent reduction by twenty fifty is is insufficient. Um, the reduction needs to be below zero for for a for a long term survivability. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding of the situation as well. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, it, Paris Accord really doesn't go enough, go yes. far enough. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it's the only point. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's transportation, but it's uh, everything else that we're doing. Agriculture is a big one for producing greenhouse gas emissions, all this stuff. So, <coughs> if there was a large scale movement towards electric vehicles, given the way we produce electricity now, would there be a net gain in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, or there would be in San Antonio? This this was brought up uh, years ago. Uh, Union concerned scientists brought up that question, uh, and it does depend on what market you're in. Uh, and in San Antonio, uh, the the uh, power generation is clean enough to where there would be a net benefit. Uh, Interestingly, in China, they're, they, they're looking at, they're into electric vehicles big time. There's a, the BYD, the electric vehicle folks, the town that they're in, the city they're in in China has something like 55,000 electric buses. Incredible. I mean, we have 400 vehicles at VIA. They have 55,000 electric ones, <laughs> uh, which shows that they use transit a lot there, and of course BYD is there, so there's that going on too. Uh, but in China, they use coal so much that it actually makes the air dirtier to what use electric. It's a company, it's a company that company. makes electric vehicles. Uh, it's like GM. Okay. Yeah, they make buses and cars and so on. Yeah. But that's just like a chicken and egg thing, right? Because they're also shutting down. Slowly doing this, may probably in reverse order. Electrify the grid, put electric vehicles on it, yay! And they may be doing it in reverse order. Yeah, it's hard to do everything right. in the right order in the right yeah, way all the time. Yeah, it just needs to all happen. It's it's Quickly. the right direction. Yeah. It may not the timing may be off a little bit, but it's I think it's the right direction. Electrification, and that, and that raises the problem. How do you get people to buy electric cars? When I was at the city. Well, first of all, if you you wouldn't most people wouldn't buy an electric car unless they had a way to charge it, right? A place to charge it, uh, and most people charge it at home, like you do your cell phone. You go home at night, you plug it in, and in the morning it's ready to go, right? Uh, that's the way I do my cell phone anyway. The same thing with an electric car. Uh, so we started. Uh, we had working with CPS and and uh, had stimulus money. We started offering. Uh, a little grant to people that would put electric vehicle chargers in their home. Um, and I don't know if it accelerated that or not, but it became obvious that the person that could afford an electric vehicle could probably afford the charger as well. And they were, all the grants were going to upper income neighborhoods yeah. and it just, from an equity standpoint, just wasn't making a lot of sense. So we don't do that anymore. <laughs>
Yeah, I don't, you know, I haven't been up to speed. I've been really busy. So I know this has been going on for a while that I kind of was supposed to attend and I didn't have the opportunity to because I've been really busy with other things. Um, but like Greg says, you know, I'm, I'm the executive director of this, for Society of Nations. We work with a lot of other communities and organizations from a na native perspective. Um, and I think one of the things that I, I try to remind people of, like, we just had this conversation about a week ago or two weeks ago with uh, the head of the EPA office out in um, Dallas. And I was asked this question, like, what does environmentalism look to me? You know, what, is, what does it look like, you know, activism, and environmentalism, protecting the environment? And to me, I always tell people that, you know, human beings, we, we overcomplicate things. You know, we make things very complicated and um, create more of a problem sometimes with our minds and, and uh, just keeping it simple, simplifying it. And for us, you know, I, I tell them that environmentalism was, it's embedded in our culture, it's embedded in our spirituality. Um, way long before the word environmentalism even existed. Um, because we were taught that, you know, we, we try to honor and respect all things that are created by the creator. You know, we live in conjunction, we coexist, and we try to leave a place better than the way that we found it. Um, not just for ourselves, but mainly for our future generations. So, so, they, so that they don't just survive, but they thrive. And that's the whole point, is that our next generations will be able to thrive. And um, I think over the time, um, we've kind of forgotten like, our responsibilities as human beings, you know? um, our jobs. You know, I, I say that we all have, you know, every life, every being has a specific job. Um, that instruction that they're given. And us as human beings, one of them is to, to live with Earth, that we're a part of this Earth, this Mother Earth, right? And we call it Mother Earth because no matter how much love she gives us, that unconditional love that a mother would give to a child, we continue to damage her, we continue to destroy her. And, um, but she continues to give us what we need to survive, right? You know, unconditional love. And, um, I think it's, it's gotten to that point where it's like we need to realize that enough is enough and we need to give back. Because one of the first teachings that we're, that we're taught when we're brought into this world, think about when you're a baby and you come into this world from the, physical, from the spirit world into the physical world. The first thing you do is what? Breathe, right? So you breathe, you take, you give back. You take, you give back. It's a natural exchange, a natural order in life, a law, a life law that we have to exist with, uh, with this earth, with this life, with this gift of life. And we're forgetting to give back. You know, we give back, the trees give back to us. And it, it turns into a cycle. You know, we, we live and in, 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 in coexist with one, one another um, with all the different life beings, whether they be the creepy crawlers, the flyers, the four legged the two legged We all have a purpose. And our purpose was to help take care of the land, help take care of the other things that are around us. Because many of the elders would say that, you know, we have, you know, as human beings, we can rationalize. We can think, you know, when we, when we say walk in beauty, that means we have our hearts and our spirits and our minds think together, you know? Because sometimes if we have one think by itself, we think irrational sometimes. So we take our time to, to calm ourselves and really pray about what it is that we're, that we're thinking about. And so when it comes to this, like, you know, you know, environmentalism, you know, protecting, you know, our future generations and their life, you know, the water, the sacred water, the land, the air, the things that we all need to survive. We all need to survive. It doesn't, you know, water isn't prejudiced towards a, a certain community, it's a certain race, or a certain people, or a certain part of the world. You know, it gives us life to all human beings. So, I mean, knowing that and understanding that is knowing that we all have that responsibility to try to protect it because we can't survive without it. You know, we can't survive, survive without clean air. I mean, if you think you can, try to stop breathing and see what happens. You know, I mean, if you can't, you can't, you can't survive without your water. If you, you know, you poison your water, you're gonna die eventually. Poison your food, you're gonna die. You need to take care of those things. And there was a time back in 2000 where this elder came down from Canada and said, you know, there's gonna be a day that you're going to realize how bad things have gotten because you're gonna be paying more for a gallon of water than a gallon of gas. And we, back in 2000, I was, you know, much younger. And I was, you know, like, you're crazy. Like, who's, I mean, back then we didn't really pay for, the, for a bottle of water, you know? It's like, you go to the faucet, you turn it on, you drink your water, you know? Like, who's gonna pay for water? But we all pay for water now. And in some places, we're paying more for a gallon of water than a gallon of gas, you know? And that's only not very long ago, it's 15 years ago. 
you know, I mean, 18 years ago. So imagine another 20 years from now, we might be, our kids might be paying $20, $30 a gallon of, gallon of water. We're already paying large amounts for clean drinking water because it's contaminated, because it's, you know, and it, it comes down to corporation. It comes down to how this society has, you know, decided to become dependent on what we as human beings in this society become dependent on. And that's why I ask about policies and why I ask about, you know, uh, proposals and how they get turned down and how they, you know, get approved and get disapproved or reapproved and changed. And we've seen it. We've seen it in Standing Rock. You know, it was taken away. The policy was put into play. They stopped it. New administration comes in. Policy's back in play again. Policies don't really mean anything. I've learned that. I've been on the grassroots. I've been on the front lines. You know, I've seen how, how, it, how things get impacted. And really, really what it comes down to is when people gather and come together in true unity, because that's what we learned at Standing Rock, right, was the power in unity. When we come together, different backgrounds, different faiths, religions, whatever it may be, we come together, we voice our opinions, and we, we stand together in true unity. There's no, no other power like it, because we will be heard, and we were heard from other places on the other side of this world. Mm -hmm. You know, That's something that can never be taken away the power and unity and the voice and the message and the awareness that we can create together. And that's what's important because that's what's gonna make you change because then we can make a conscious decision to say, okay, what can we do to make those changes? Really, like I feel, like I said, it's the bottom line. It's always the bottom line with these corporations. You affect the bottom line, you start changing what you become dependent on. And I've had many people say, well, you're out there fighting for the pipeline and the oil, but you're driving a car. Yeah, I'm driving a car. <laughs> yeah, I got some gas. I used to repaint once in a while. That's not the issue. Think about how many people want to eat organic, right? How expensive is it for a family to go eat on organic, eat all organic food? It's expensive. So individual people can't just go out and say, let's start doing it individually. We can to a certain degree. We start making changes in our personal lives, like start recycling more, start leaving a smaller footprint, start um, you know, traveling less than what you really need to, whatever it may be, you know, whatever you're, you know, what it looks like to you as far as the kind of footprint you leave behind. But in reality, what it comes down to the bottom line is, you know, the less you, the more you tell these companies, the less we're going to use you, unless you start incorporating these new policies, right? Because that one percent, those corporations, they only care about the bottom line, and they decide what us as society become dependent on. They dictate what we become dependent on, you know, and we have to force that one percent to tell them, look, you need to add renewable energy. You need to add you know, uh, a green energy policies, whatever it may be, new, new, new um, ways of, of creating, substitu substituting the way you um, bring in your, your funds, you know. We live in, like, we're out in Texas and they're putting pipelines. You go out to West Texas, it's, there's so much land out there, you can have so many, you know, solar farms out there, it's, it's insane. But they don't, they'd rather put a pipeline because it's already something they're accustomed to, something they're already used to. They're, they're, they want their bottom line. They want to pump all this gas and oil into Mexico and across the Gulf and overseas because they're gonna pay for it over there. It always comes down to the bottom line and we need to start standing together more and to pass that message on and say, look, you need to make changes. We need you to make those changes. Stop talking about it. Stop making policies that keep getting changed. Stop you know, putting proposals on the table and having them not go anywhere. Let's really say, you know, hey, we can put people in space and create a space station, but we can't, you know, f figure out a way of leaving a smaller footprint? Come on, it's, it's we're in a time and age where it's, it's we can, we're live streaming. We have computers in our hands, you know, that you couldn't say 10, 15, 20 years ago what we can possibly do today. So, I mean, it, it really comes down to us just letting them know that, hey, enough is enough. And when it comes, you know, we've taken so much that we have to start giving back start thinking and start acting in ways that we can give back to this earth to help help her to heal and to rebuild. Because in reality, you know, she's gonna get, you know, this earth is gonna become so damaged that there's gonna be no turning back. But one day, she will take care of herself. We, we will diminish ourselves. We will suffer because of the things that we've created. And Mother Earth will eventually take care of herself. She, she will heal with or without us. But we would like to be able to coexist and continue to keep living, have our next generations continue to, to thrive, not just survive. You know, and I had that elder that came down and said, you're gonna pay that much for the gas, 
you know, for, for a gallon of water, for then as more more for, than a gallon of gas, and the trees are talking about leaving, and we need to pray for those things. The glaciers are falling into the oceans, and you know we're losing that fresh water. And he says the next world war is going to be over fresh drinking water. I believe that. I believe the um, the next major war, world war, will be over fresh drinking water because we keep on leading corporations throughout. Because no more about you know. U.S. economy, it's about a world economy, and then it's really who runs it is the corporations. You have co corporations like Wells Fargo that goes in and funds all the fossil fuel industry pipelines and extractions, and I remember this, this, uh, this reporter saying, he says, what do you expect was going to happen? You know, you're complaining about, you know, bad air quality, you're complaining about contaminated water, you're complaining about contaminated land and wildlife dying by the thousands along the Gulf, in California or the Pacific. He says, what do you expect was going to happen when you're pulling, you're sucking death out of the ground? Because it's fossil fuel. It's death. So you're just going to have death on top of death on top of death. And it's never going to stop. It's going to be a cycle until we decide we need to heal and we need to stop doing this harm that we're doing. And, you know, when he came and talked to us, we were kind of like, you know, a lot of us that were young at the time, we're like, nah, this is insane. This is Nobody's gonna do that for the water. Nobody's gonna, you know, that's, this is crazy. This is crazy. And like, sure enough, it came, it came true. And it's sad. It makes me scared. And the reason why I'm out there is because of my kids. I got, I got kids. I got daughters. I want to see their kids, you know, thrive and, and live a, a good, healthy life. And so, you know, those elders that come around and talk about our teachings, you know, and those natural teachings, those the ones that we tend to forget, you know, like the breathing, you know, like how, how often you go throughout your day and you say, like, oh, you know, I, I'm taking and I'm giving back, you know. Maybe, you know, I take this, maybe I should go give something back. When you go throw an offering down, say a prayer, say thank you, you know. And um, I think we've forgotten that. And I think that we need to realize as human beings, you know, environmentalism is really it's just about respect. It's really what it is, you know. It's about respect, leaving a place better than the way you found it, and, you know, trying to help your next the next generation thrive and not just survive. Let them have them look, look forward to something rather than to something to, to dread, you know? And right now, if we continue on the path that we are, you know, it might be too late by the time our kids are ready to stand up for themselves. It might be too late, you know? And, and that's what scares me is that, you know, that that's what's happening here today. And, you know, we have our people that are standing up. And it makes me proud and happy to see our people coming together and showing that unity, bringing them where we have more awareness about environmentalism and about you know the climate change than we ever have in the history of the United States because how we share our information. We became our own media. And that was one of the biggest things in Standard Rock and in West Texas. You know, we had plenty of people in West Texas that were fighting, putting this, you know, becoming their own media. You know, Gray came out there, did some work out there. I mean, we that's important. Our voices are important. Your your voice, what you can do on your own as an individual, is powerful. It's absolutely powerful. I, thought, I went to speak to these kids at a sociology department over at Rice University, and they asked, you know, what can we do? I'm like, just them wanting to have this discussion is powerful because it's, it's the awareness, right? It's the awareness. If, if we're not, you know, going to sit there and, and like really consider it and think about our own individual impact that we, that we do ourselves, then we're ignoring it. We're not really embracing it. You know, I said, that I went up to Pittsburgh. <laughs> And there was a bunch of environmentalists there, right? It was this, this, this um, it was like a, a, a summit. And I got up and they asked me to, to say something. I said, you know, this is to me, is like, a, like an AA group, you know, like an anonymous group, right? I said, the first thing you need to do as an environmentalist is first admit to yourself that you're a hypocrite and you're contradicting. Because you all drove here. You all bought some clothes at the store that was made somewhere on the other side of this world. You're all drinking some water out of some bo out of bottle of water out of some plastic. We're all we're all doing some, we're all we're all hypocrites and contradictions to some degree. But now that we can acknowledge that and see that, now we can heal from that, right? Because now psychologically, you're gonna be like, well, I'm gonna try to recycle a little more because <laughs> I got called out, right? And I, I am a hypocrite. I am contradicting. I just drove over here in an SUV, it sucks up gas like this like this water, you know. So it's like, but I don't drive. I work at home, so I I find ways to like you know, reduce my footprint. And we're gonna do that more often. As, as, as long as we continue to tell ourselves that, hey, we're part of the problem. And if we're part of the problem, the people around us. So let's, you know, let's not hate on each other. Let's not, 
you know, condemn one another. Let's find ways how to work together to make those drastic changes that we need to make as a society, as a people, as a community, because it affects all of us. This ground we touch is the same ground somebody else on this side of the world is touching. You know, the air we breathe, we're all sharing it. And people across the other world is on the other side of the world is sharing it. The water we drink is the same water that they're drinking. And all those things that we're sharing has been shared for generations, for thousands of years. You know, we're breathing the same air that our ancestors breathed. We're, we're drinking the same water that our ancestors drank. And that's why to us, as to many of our people, we believe that our ancestors' memories are in, is in that water. Because we're made, our bodies are made of water, right? We're born into water. We come into this world in that womb. That's why we call those women you know, our life givers. They're very important to us as, as a native culture. They're our life givers. They help bring the, the spirits from the physical world into, I mean, the spiritual, the spiritual world into the physical world. And we come in that water, and then our bodies are made of that water. And then when we die, and as we get older, there's less water in our body. And when we die, all that water goes back. So we're like in this huge fishbowl of us all just sharing each other's everything. And you start to think about it too much, you're like, oh my God, you know, like, oh, damn. You know, but... <laughs> That's life. It's a big recycling bowl, you know? We all share. We're all connected. We're all part of each other. We're all relatives. We're all human beings that need exactly the same thing that the next person needs in order to survive. You know, and I think we just, as far as environmentalism, we need to stop overcomplicating things and say, you know what? Screw the 10 different policies that, you know, are really dependent on, you know, which one's going to make more money here or who's going to make more money over here or, you know, how can we put this over here? It's like, Look, if it's the best solution that we have to make the best change that we can right now, then make it. If a better one comes up 10 years from now, then rethink it and do it again and improve it again 10 years now. Don't wait 50 years, you know, because there's technology that's coming out now that they had for generations, you know? And it's like, and that's the thing, it's the holdup. It's the corporations, and it's always gonna come down to the corporations. And we did that very thing by putting these corporations in our office. He is a representative of the corporation. He is a corporation. He is all about business. And it just made things even that more worse. Because as soon as he became, you know, president, or that 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 cabinet became the cabinet of the yard today, all these things benefited businesses. Not people, businesses. Because that's the way they think. And the, the thing that we have to remind ourselves is that we help to contribute towards that, unfortunately, right? Because I always say, like, sometimes our own worst people is our, is our own people, you know, that are closest to us. You know, there's towns here in Texas and throughout the United States that they can't drink their water. You know, I, I've been to those towns, and I said, you know what, I want to come here, I'm going to protest. There's, there's, there's this plants here, the refineries are here, I'm going to protest. And they tell me, no, they can't drink their water, but they don't want us there. You know why they don't want us there? Because it became dependent on the money. Their, son, their daughters and sons don't have jobs anymore. But they can't drink water. They, can't, they have to go buy it or boil it. But they don't want us to protest it. So you have to think about how do we deal with that? Because that's a whole other issue. How do you deal with that? How do you heal from that? How do you re-educate those people? How do you, you know, and the only way really is to bring in renewable concepts, you know? Bring in solar farms. Come, bring in wind, tur wind, wind turbines. Bring in, you know, recyclable water treatment centers, you know, bring in these things that doesn't require them to have to become dependent on the oil industry coming in, taking over their town, giving everybody jobs, let them drive around with brand new trucks every month, and then take it all away from them so that they can hurt and want them back. Because that's what's happening. And it's happening throughout all of, all of Texas and all throughout all of the United States. And that's what we have to take into consideration. You know, I think us as human beings, as far as native, our native peoples and our spirituality and our way of life, you know, when we say mataki yasin, it means all, all things, all my relatives. And that means everything, not just human beings. It means everything. And knowing that we're connected in one form or another. You know, you study your body, we, we have minerals in us, the same that are in the ground, the same that are in the stars. We are all connected. You know, we're all, you know, related to one another in some form or another. So I think, you know, just really trying to simplify those, those people that are in those positions need to be reminded, like, you know, like I even say, like, people like, like Kelsey Warren, he needs prayers too, he's a human being, you know? I pray for him, <laughs> even though I can't stand the guy, I pray, I pray for him, 
to have some humility and humbleness in his in his heart and his mind and his spirit to make to start thinking differently. Remind folks to want to make Kelsey changes. Warren Kelsey Warren is the uh, is the CEO of of, uh, of um, Energy Transfer Partners that's responsible for you know Dapple, um, the North Dakota Access Pipeline, and the Transpectus Pipeline that we had Two Rivers Camp at. Um, Society of Nations and Big Bend Defense Coalition uh, came together to. Uh, create this camp to fight the camp. We had like 18 people get arrested there, felony charges, slowed up. You know, it really it was coming down to slowing them down to try to get more people out, you know, give them a chance to come out and, you know, affect their bottom line, affect their money. You know, I mean, that was the only way because we had th those policies changed. We saw it in North Dakota. It was stopped and then re and then re entered. And then, and then here it is, Kelsey Warren. We got him to meet with us, right? We, we got him, we went to the Parks and Wildlife Services, mind you, that is supposed to protect and preserve those natural areas for future generations. But meanwhile, a, corporate, a, a, a CEO of a corporation that is his job to destroy the land so he can put in pipelines and pump out oil and gas is sitting on that board. That in itself is a contradiction. But anyways, we showed up to that board meeting and we got him to agree to meet with us. So he put us off and put us off and put us off. And as soon as Trump won, his election, he said, there's no reason to meet with you anymore. Because <laughs> he knew he was going to support his decision. So there's no reason to, to meet with the community anymore. So you got those kinds of things that are happening. You know, you got, you know, issues like in West Texas where they're abusing eminent domain because Texas is 80-something percent privately owned. And they're abusing eminent domain that's meant for public services to put these pipelines on, you know, so that way they don't have to worry about doing an environmental impact study and worrying about you know the public's consent or anything like that. They, they're, they're abusing eminent domain, right? And then you got places like in Louisiana where our people out there are finding you know, um, the pipelines out there where they went and bought land in front of the pipeline and what they do? They just reroute it around the land. <laughs> just like policy, right? They, they approve it, disapprove it, and then reapprove it. Same thing, they're, they're, they're finding whatever ways they can to do whatever, whatever it is that they want to do. And that's the problem, you know, you look at Keystone that was, that was killed years ago, and here it is, policy, right back into play again. And that's what I'm saying, po it's policy, I'm not, don't get me wrong, that part of the work is important. The legal aspects are important, because it, it, it brings awareness also. And it's another tool. But I just, I'm just saying that what I've learned, my experience in the last couple of years of being on these grassroots, you know, our organization predominantly you know, focuses on preserving, you know, society and nations, focuses on preserving and protecting our culture, our spirituality of, of indigenous people of the South and the North. And part of that is environmentalism because it is embedded in our culture. And that's why we're involved in environmentalism. So on those grassroots, it's been like being on the front lines, we've seen that really what, it, what seems to only work is when you affect the bottom line. It's the only time they're really gonna listen to you. I want to, I want to trans transition into yeah. some q and A. I I know folks who are really wanting to engage, and I think one of the things that, that I, I, I take away, and, and we've had this conversation before, and we've had it with some folks in here, is that we do function in policy, we do advocate, we try to get particular changes made, and we're working a lot in this climate plan, and yet I think, uh, at least I, I walk with an understanding that the only real change is going to come with cultural transformation, yeah. right? Individual and group cultural transformation, like you're describing, right. and I, what I thought was interesting that you said here is that these renewable concepts, indigenous concepts of, of give and take and shared and, and mutual dependence, interdependence, are how we can then explain renewable energy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I really appreciate you, you, you sharing that with us. And I don't know if other folks wanted to engage. We've got a few minutes to, to talk. Don't shock me with your silence. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. No, I have a question. So. <clears throat> In this country, uh, decisions are made by politicians, mm -hmm. and we're responsible to elect those people. Right. So how do you turn your passion into getting out the vote? The reason we're in this problem now with this cabinet and this administration is people taking their vote for granted and not using it. Right. Um, that's a very good question, and we've talked about that many times. And I, I think, <laughs> personally, like you know, I'm a pretty blunt person. I, I just think people have gotten lazy. You know, I mean, 
I remember being at a ceremony one time and Orville Looking Horse comes out. This is back in 2002 and he goes, you know, our generation is, is an instant generation, this new generation coming up, it's an instant generation. He called it a drive through McDonald's. They're a drive through McDonald's generation because you got instant pay bills, instant coffee, instant food, you know, everything's instant. You know, I mean, we've changed, I mean, everything's, you know, uh, convenience, right? And they've gotten to a point where they just kind of like expect things to kind of fall in the lap sometimes, you know? And, and it's hard to deal with that because you're trying to re-educate them to let them know. And what I usually say to them <laughs> is that, you know, because a lot of them will say, well, I, you know, we vote and it doesn't mean anything, right? A lot of them feel that and that's what they're going to say. Mm -hmm. And the way I usually say it is like, <laughs> I say, you know, I vote, you know, because I believe that it can make a change, but, you know, I predominantly, I vote because I want to, I want to be legitimate and have, you know, and be, I want to have the right to talk shit. <laughs> if I don't vote, then I shouldn't talk shit. So I tell them, if you want to talk shit, you know, about what's happening in the politics and the policies that are being, then go on vote. Go on vote. So that way you can say, you know what, I'm, I'm speaking about those things because I did vote on it. And I was a part of it. And I feel like my vote didn't count. Don't say, you know, I don't think nothing's going to be done or nothing, you know, the policy that's got, getting approved is bad if you didn't go out there to try to do something about it. So they are working in the community to try to get, you know, people to come out more. And I think in the last few um, elections, you know, if we're talking about, you know, uh, presidential elections, you know, I think those numbers have changed, especially when Obama came out, right? There was people that were voting that never voted before. And um, I think that was just because, you know, there was some, a lot of hype, you know, there was a lot of um, a, a different thought of how, uh, how well progressed our society had become, right? And then we got slapped in the face and said, no, it's not really a reality. This is really the truth. There is still a very large division in our society. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's going to take a lot more uh, for serious change. It's going to take a lot more than, than, than uh, one or two times coming out and, and trying to make a point. You know, we have to continue to make that point. So I think we have to spend a lot of time with the people. You know, like for me, there's two types of ignorance, right? There's ignorance of just, you don't know. And then there's ignorance of like choice. And that's the one that you don't, you know, like I don't entertain, you know? Ignorance of not understanding, we have to, un you know, we have to help them to educate them, help them to understand why is it important, even when they feel that their vote doesn't count. And that's what it is, is bringing what we did in situations like this, coming together. We had, in West Texas, we had people come all the way from Wales, New England, all the way from New um, what's that country? Uh, huh? New Zealand? You know, it was uh, Norway. Uh, Flew all the way from Norway into the camp. Same thing with Standing Rock. Came, came from all over the world. I mean, you know, and it's like, that's important to acknowledge because that means it can be done. The awareness can be done. And I think that's what it is. It's the awareness. It's, you have to inspire, right? You have to make them feel invested. And that's when they don't feel invested is when they don't want anything to do with it. So how do we, we have to figure out ways to get people to feel like they're invested in it, like true change. And I think by doing things like this, doing other things within your communities, like programs that bring them out, that let their voices be heard, I think they'll feel more inspired to want to vote and make changes in, in the political aspect in a way. Yeah, not voting and talking shit's another example of hypocrisy. Yeah, we're, yeah. Running, we're right at a minute to tell us anybody else. I just have a quick comments. question. Yeah. So um, I guess kind of jumping off of what we're talking about right now, uh, what are some of the things that you felt were like the most effective um, Standing Rock as far as like engaging people and like making them aware of what's happening? Because I know like here in our community, you know, we try to like engage people and bring them in into the issues um, through education. And but sometimes, you know, it's hard to reach them. So how, what do you think was the most effective in Standing Rock as far as that made people like from other countries like fly and come over and just to help? I think, I think it's the visuals in like, in the unity. Mm -hmm. You know, when people see that people are coming together that are come from different faiths and religions and backgrounds, I think that's powerful. You know, when you see people coexisting that way, um, because, because, you know, there is a lot of historical trauma, right? And it, and it takes time to heal from that. Mm -hmm. And you have to learn new ways on how to coexist with that healing with each other. Right, and so you have to create, continue to to create new environments and new 
you know, ways to get people engaged together to, to, to grow it, to get it bigger. And a lot of that, to me, was what I seen helped to contribute towards that was the awareness, you know, becoming our own media. Uh, you know, how many people became their own media and went out there and interviewed other people that are not even from their own community? That's powerful. You know, I'm gonna go interview somebody from Norway that's a completely different perspective of how we live. And I'm gonna ask them, and then I'm gonna engage. So now they get to engage and they get to hear each other, right? So it's the engagement that I feel, you know, the whole media, the whole understanding, you know, of working together in unity and also understanding the perspective of like, you know, our, our traditional way of life, our ceremonial way of life, our spiritual way of life is, is really embedded on just, like we don't, have, like I always say, we don't have a word uh, for our way of life, our spirituality, like religions do, like Catholicism, Christianity, Calvinism, Baptism. We don't have a word like that. But if we did, it would be respect. That would be our word because it's about respecting the things and the elements that we live around and honoring those things, right? You know, because, you know, it's a give and take. It's part of our way of life. It's part of our teaching. And so I think help, helping people to understand that, like for us with youth, youth was a very big thing. And youth, so to get them to understand like why we're fighting for this water was to get them out there to experience why we are fighting for this water. When they enjoy the waters, they jump into the rivers, they go into the oceans, they have this fun, they create a memory, an experience, now they have a, an emotional tie, right? So all those kind of things, I think, fall into place. I think all those programs all help. Mm -hmm. And really it is it's just trying to engage in, in, a, you know, in a talking environment, you know, so that you can better understand each other, you know? And I think that's important because, you know, one of the most important things I've seen was I went to the Parliament World Religion down in Utah, right? And there's people, there's 10,000 people that showed up. Different religions, different backgrounds, groups, every, everything you could possibly imagine was there. It's powerful. But the most powerful thing out of the whole week was I walked in for lunch, and you had every religion, every way of life, every way of thinking. Those people were all eating together, sitting on the floor. Nobody was sitting above another. Everyone was equal, everyone was sitting and, and, and sharing a meal together. That was powerful, Ooh. powerful. So for me, it's like that, if you can, if you can duplicate that in, in your own little communities here and there, and then it just can, you know, continues to grow. So that's what I believe, I mean, from my experiences anyway, so. Awesome. Thank you, thank you. Yep, no problem, thank you.